waiting. No is, this is the uh, this is what herding cats is like. I get it. <laughs> Put that on your pocket. You got it. Yeah. Yeah. And this will be very this will be very loose. Well, if I'm involved, it will be. <laughs> that is a fact. I, I, I got some hints that I might have to do some bleeping or something. Uh, well, I don't know. Anywhere. Should I not cuss? Cause you can do what you I cuss all the time. It's horrible. You can do what you like. I bet. It's, just, <laughs> it's just ingrained in me. <laughs> I tell the students, I cuss a lot and I vape. And, you know. And are we rolling? If you can't handle it, just deal <laughs> with it. Helped. Because, believe me, people are right. going to do worse things that you work with later. Yeah. <laughs> and this isn't that bad. Or right, I try are not to rolling? make it too bad. Who am I talking to? That or that? It, whatever you want. Okay. That one's probably going to be more focused on you, but <coughs> you can you can talk to absolutely anybody you like. As long as you have the nose filter that doesn't make it any larger than it is, that would <laughs> be perfect. But so you guys are a master class, is that correct? That is correct. That is correct. Yeah. How's it going so far? Awesome. Right. Fantastic. Have you learned anything? Yeah. Well, now that's the shit that matters. What, what have you learned? Because Mark asked you the question, and it went silent. <laughs> well, you know, we learned quite a bit from Paul on, on regarding drums good. and what oh, to look yeah. for. Yeah. And, and I mean, it, he was just. Just let fact, me just solve all your problems. Get an RCA forty-four. Put it about a foot away from the kick head, not near the hole on the you know on the other side. Cut 200, boost 50, and it's the best fucking sound you'll ever hear. <laughs> it's the greatest kick drum sound you'll ever hear. Wow. That 44 records 10 cycles, I'm convinced. It's unbelievable. <laughs> it's got great bottom end. And then I usually stick a 91 inside the drum if I need the top end, the attack. But if you're making a record with, with, uh, <laughs> um, oh my God, here I am looking at his face, a mental, uh, mental block in his name. Jim oh, Keltner. No, uh, Waddy. Oh. With Waddy Wattel, don't add any high end to the kick drum. He fucking hates high end on a kick drum. <laughs> I've been doing this my whole life. I've never heard a kick drum sound like that, you know. So, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know I love him. Yeah. I made a Stevie Nicks record with him wow. a couple of years ago. It was a blast. We had a great time. And Dave Stewart, who was the other co producer. But anyway, SM57 on the snare, 99% of the time is going to solve your, your troubles. You know, it's 99% of the music we hear in SM57 is on that snare. Um, 67's on toms. You can afford it. <laughs> C12's on the hi-hat, snare bottom and overheads. That's what I like. Um, but I'm American. I like, in I like condenser overheads. You, being English, would want uh, ribbon overheads. Yeah. And I get it. We like, we like a bit of both. Yeah. Sure, sure. Well, what we did here, because you have... Arguably the greatest mic collection I've ever seen in my entire life. Thank you. Because we did all of it. Yeah. We had good. 67s as overheads. Good. Hands, good. And we did Coles as well. Yeah. yeah. So that the guys can all take away these files and go, oh, I like the Coles now, I like the 67s. No, if you'd have put up C12s, you'd have been throwing rocks at all that other shit. I'll just oh. that I'm telling you right now, I mean it. I we, use C12As on my tongs. Oh, that's good. Yeah. yeah, that's great. I think we ended up over 60 mics on that, on the bottom <laughs> set, right? You know, we had 43 on Neil Peart's kit yeah. when they recorded in A. Oh. That was just to cover the toms up. No, 43. <laughs> I, I could not believe it. I went, oh, my God. Nick, uh, here I am with names today. I'm sucking air. I don't, don't worry about anyway, it. Same way. Uh, Res Linux, the guy who produced, you know, they covered all the bases. And then I think they ended up using the three mic setup. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> you know, why not? And the 44 on the kick. You know? Oh, yeah. You got to have the 44 on the kick. That's yeah. a great mic. I'm not a big FET 47 fan on the kick. You know, I'm not an NS10 thing. No. I don't get it. An M88, if you're on a budget, that's a great freaking kick mic. And it is. But cut 200, boost 50. I'm just telling you right now. That will... That's the sound you want, I'm guessing. Unless you're English, then boost 100 instead of 50. Because, <laughs> you know, I think 50 they shy away from because that's where their ship buzzes and ours is at 60. I don't know what it is, but anyway, um, 50 cycles, that's a man's frequency right there. It really is. It just happens to work with an API very nicely. Yeah, it there does. You go. It does. Or a Neve. Or a Neve. Yeah. Neve has 56, so I, I'm a little off, but it, it's all right. It Plus sounds the jazz. Great. Oh, man. I love a great console. My favorite console is the 8078 we have over in A. We bought it, turned it upside down for about eight months, 
and completely redid everything. I bought it from Donald Fagan. They made Asia and the Nightfly on that console, so obviously it was fucked up. It didn't sound good. So we thought, well, let's fix this, you know? So I blew another 300 grand making this console perfect. Jeff Tanner, who worked for Neve in 75 or whenever they built that console, came in. He's an L.A. guy, Phoenix Audio. Jeff came in. He knew every issue that console had, uh, even out of the factory. And um, we addressed every issue. And we used silver Vera Strand wire at 50 bucks a foot for the stereo bus. We used black gate capacitors that are 10 bucks instead of 40 cents. But you know what? At the end of the day, that console is worth every penny and more. It sounds amazing. I love that desk. So many people will come in, throw up the faders, hit play, and go, what the fuck did you do? Oh my God, it's great. <laughs> well, it's because you're going through the right bus and you're, you know, running it the way, or doing audio the way we're accustomed to, that we fell in love with audio from all these older records. And the more I listen to vinyl, the less important the drums become. When I listen to shit like Van Morrison, the drums are in the next county, almost. <laughs> it's lead vocal, bass guitar. Yep. You know, and all my bass player buddies love that shit. <laughs> <laughs> they do. They love it. But the right bass playing, when it's melodic, it's magic. It really is. Doesn't get a lot of credit. But, the, yeah, like I said, the more I listen to old vinyl, the less important drums become and the more important everything else becomes. But the problem is we have this much space and how are we going to fill it up? And, you know, that's why the Beatle mono mixes I really love, especially like Rubber Soul Revolver, because they spent so much time filling up that space properly in mono, which is a real challenge compared to stereo. And as everybody here knows, when the Beatles went stereo, they'd have the drum kit all on one side, they'd have the vocal all on one side. And I thought that was cool as hell. So when I first started, I, I was doing a lot of hard panning. And then I'm in Kroger one night and I hear my wife's song and there's no vocal because it's all on one side. <laughs> they got the other side, you know? They didn't do a left-right mono thing. They did, well, we'll just turn up one channel. <laughs> but anyway, I get off on a tangent sometimes, not meaning to. Do I get off on tangents? No. 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 I, I, I like the tangents. Yes. Like the tangents. Well, thanks for having us here. This has been an absolutely phenomenal experience. Uh, I love this place. I mean, I could have been retired, but instead I'm fucking broke as fuck and up to <laughs> debt, up to here. But I love my life. I don't care. Man, I love it. I had no choice but to work at music. I had to. Now, growing up in Wichita, Kansas, that I didn't realize it until I was 20 years old. I thought, well, no, I'll become, you know, I was going pre-med at school. I ended up quitting school and everything else and doing music full time. And that's hard in Wichita. It really is. And then, I, you know, I had a couple of club systems that I'd built up over a few years. And then I wanted to be able to do a concert, like a two to 5,000 seat venue. And so I needed like 75 grand and went through the SBA and, you know, my application was this thick, and three months later they call back and go, well, we'll do the loan, but there's one condition. Your parents have to put their house up for collateral. Well, their house is worth 75 grand. So I went, I have two brothers and a sister, and I went to my mom and dad. I go, well, they said okay, but this, this is stupid because they want the house as collateral. And my parents said, we'll do it. And you will work overtime when you think about your parents being homeless, I promise. <laughs> Or you better, <laughs> you know? And when I tell that story around my kids, I go, I'm not as fucking crazy as your grandparents. <laughs> don't, don't even think about it. <laughs> Plus, that shit's tied up here anyway, probably. Anyway. But, but grew the sound company in 97. Claire, the biggest sound company in the world, bought, bought me out. I still am employed by Claire. I go in about once every three months, say hey. I don't get called unless shit hits the fan, you know, and then hopefully I know somebody that can help make it better. But it's a great company, so I, you know, I, that shit doesn't hit the fan too often. Um, I love live, been touring my whole life, and um, 
I love it. But I love the studio, too. I was getting interviewed by Leadership Music one year. Massenburg, I think, was the, the uh, MC or whatever. And uh, I told these people, I go, you know, when you're a live guy, you think these studio guys are pussies. Because they got a thousand <laughs> chances. They got a controlled room. They got great mics. They have great players. And I said, but now that I've been in the studio a couple of years, I pretty much feel the same way. So, anyway. <laughs> I love the studio. But, man, we are spoiled rotten. We have, and here, we do have great rooms. Thank God. Yeah. I think it's about 50% luck, to be honest. And don't get me wrong, I hired fucking Peter D'Antonio from RPG or PRG or PGR, whatever his company is. They do a lot of the diffusion that you see around here. And uh, Mike Cronin, who was the studio designer, but he's a Tom Hidley disciple. And so, anyway, we worked and, and the rooms turned out well. Mm. And I'm very, very happy about that. Mm. And I even got D'Antonio to admit that about half of it is luck. Because it's complicated as hell, studying the physics of sound and what we hear and the reflections and everything. That's why I love going in there and listening so much. We just got done listening in there. From about 300 to about 4K, there's literally no reflection back into the room. Above that, there's a little. Below that, we have the 50 cycle diffusers in the corners. When we first built that room, there's a blind piano player named Gordon Moat who will hear shit that I'll never hear. I just accepted it, finally. <laughs> and Gordon, who's 100% blind, will walk down the hall in the in the A room to go to the restroom doing this. And he hears doors, and he hears walls, and he hears, hears everything. Yeah, it's like a bat. And so I told Gordon about the design of the room and what it was, and I go, I want you to go over there with me. And there was nothing in the room yet. So I had him by the arm, and we're walking in. He's doing this. He goes, okay. And then I go, okay, we're about to the middle. He goes, okay. And we keep walking. He goes, oh, I hear that. And there was a fucking mic stand. <laughs> and I thought, I'm going to choke you, man. <laughs> How did you hear that mic stand? So I moved it. I go, okay, we're getting closer to the wall. We're getting a little closer. And he touched oh, the wall. And he goes, oh, my God, I'd kill myself in here. And I'm like, <laughs> it works. It really does. Because, you know, I said to George originally, if you want to do something together, let me know. He goes, well, I've had the perfect room in my head for 25 years. I go, fuck, let's build it, you know. And we did. <laughs> but there are days when you are spending a million dollars where you go, sure hope this room sounds good. Because <laughs> you know? it is about half luck. Even with George, though, it's more like 10% luck. Because George... I don't like the genius word. I, uh, I try not to use it too often, but George really is. And that will have to wait, and I'll go over to... I didn't do my proper etiquette before starting. Anyway, um, so, yeah, I sold my sound company in 97 to Claire, and for the first time in my life, Martina and I had a little money. And that was about... The, she came out, her first album came out in 92, but we'd only paid the accountants and the lawyers and the bus companies and... And the IRS. And everybody else. <laughs> the first five years, we didn't make really shit that we could keep. And so, but in 97, she had a big record come out, and it did well. And so I thought, I was kind of lost because we had no debt. And I thought, what the? I was, it was pointless. I need that fear motivation thing, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I kind of do. I kind of wandered around, and then I thought, well, shit. You know, I originally wanted to get a studio in Wichita, and the, they laughed at me at the bank. Thank God, because I'd still be there struggling with this little room, you know. Probably a neotech or something, because that's what I thought was cool in 1980 <laughs> or whatever. But, um, 78 probably. Um, the, you know, originally I never really was happy with Martina's vocal sound on her early record. Because I, I worked with her live. I knew how great she is. And, you know, to me it was just too thin and too not pleasing enough to, whatever. So originally we thought we'll put a vocal booth in the garage and just record the vocals here. And then that turned into this somehow. <laughs> I went, well, I found a place, 2806. 
you know, and this in 2002, and I, I closed on it January 15, 2002. I know the day because it's my birthday and it's easy and <coughs> that works. And then proceeded to spend money like a drunken sailor for six years. Spent 18 million of our dollars and then borrowed 12 million more, you know. Spent it all and then, and now the last three years we finally are, are standing on our own two feet. <laughs> or four years probably. But um, fortunately, I have a very understanding wife who is my best friend, who, you know, and my partner. You're here. And she knows that eventually something good's going to happen. Now, when we had the big flood in 2010, I thought, shit, my one chance to make money at this studio. <laughs> but then we're in Berry Hill. That's the problem. We should have been in Berry Valley. <laughs> I would have got a fat check and said, fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> now, John, but, did you meet Martina when you were doing live sound for her? Or no, I, I met her in, in 87, January of 87. She was singing in a local club band, and she rented a place for me to put a band together. A new band. I had a little rehearsal room at my sound company in Wichita. And that's how we met. And then all I said, I had to chase her down for the money. We became friends. It worked out. But that's not true. Martina, man, she was, she's a sure. pro. Yeah, she is. We met in January, started dating in April, got engaged in May, set it a year ahead, got married in May of 88. Wow. So 30 years this year. We just had her oh, that's awesome. anniversary. Oh, yeah. It's great. She's oh shit. John, what day? Uh, May 15th. My birthday. All right. There you go. In 88, you were probably three or four. I'm I was 18. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> you know, everybody looks younger to me than, than they are. Actually, I was 22. Graduated right. from BMI that year. All right. All right. And uh, anyways... And, she had a plan. I didn't know it at the time, but she had a plan. She was seeing rock and pop music <coughs> when I met her. <clears throat> She'd grown up singing country and decided she wanted to go back to singing country because she was tearing up her chords and everything else. And so I started mixing her in a couple of country bands that she played in. And then, oh, probably six months after we got married, she goes, we need to move to Nashville. And I went, all right, cool. You know, what the hell? I don't care. You know, I why not? So we moved to Nashville in January on January first, nineteen ninety. I went to work for Garth Brooks. She got a record deal in ninety one, and starting in ninety one, I was production manager for Garth. And I thought only in the movies does this shit happen, but it happened to me in real life. You know, she, we came to Nashville and fuck. She's got a record deal, and I'm working with the biggest act in music, practically. And somehow, it just happened. And it's been a bit of a blur since 1990, but I've been had a great life, been very fortunate, gotten to work in music. I Like I said, I think I have no choice. I really think probably everyone in this room has the same thing I have where it gets in your DNA, and nothing is as satisfying as working in music. And that's what I have to do. If I was an accountant, I'd have my toe on the trigger right now. <laughs> I'd fucking blow my head off. Probably. I probably would. I'm not kidding. But luckily, I'm not an accountant. You know, I get to work I around here. So. <laughs> <laughs> we have an accountant here? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for ruining the business, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Accountants and lawyers have fucked up everything. You know? <laughs> <laughs> they really have. Uh, but I understand you need to know and you need to be fiscally responsible and all that, and I'm not those things. So, so of course, you know, I get bothered by that. But No, but now that, you know, I'm not fucking kid anymore. Fortunately, Martina has paid more attention to getting us back to where we could retire if we have to, whatever. Even though I'll never retire. Never. I'll, and if she doesn't want to work, I'll go, I'll go gig with somebody. Because I love gigging. And I love doing sound. I love live. But I love studio, too. Tracking days, to me, are the best days. Period. You go in that morning, nothing. You leave that day with a song or two that could change the world. 
I don't know what's better than that. I really don't know if there is anything better than that. Yeah. It's kind of like giving birth in a way, you know. But now this song is your child. Now, make no mistake, in Nashville and everywhere else, the song is the most important thing in any session. You can have a great song and record it on a cassette deck in your parents' garage, and it's still going to be a great song. And you can take an okay song and spend a million bucks, and it's a great record, but an okay song. It doesn't really matter. Good is the enemy of great. Don't forget that. We're tempted to take good every time, you know? But honestly, you need great to get anyone's attention. And that's just been proven to me over and over and over and over again. If we'd have built an average studio in 2002, I'd have been out of business 10 years ago, easily. But somehow, we've hung on, and there's still enough top-shelf work that we stay damn busy. Three or four years ago, I started a school. The school is a client of the studios. It's one of our best clients because the school is year-round. They always need two or three rooms. We have nine rooms. And so, thanks to the school, it's really solidified the foundation every year to where we can afford to keep doing what we're doing. And I don't give a fuck about making millions of dollars. I just want to keep doing what I'm doing. If I can cover my overhead, I'm gaining some equity every year, I guess, you know. But I have, I, I want to work here. I don't want to work a real job. If I had to get a real job, that would be hard. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Any questions, you guys? Anything you want to talk about? You guys from all over the country, I take it? All over the world. The world, yeah. World. Germany, yes, Sam. A couple of Germans. Yeah. Right. Ralph as well. Yeah. We have an Australian. There's Ralph, he's from Germany. We have an Australian. The, the accountant was Canadian. Oh. Yeah, a couple of Canadians. A couple of Canadians. <laughs> yeah, the accountant's Well, Canadian. you know what? If the American government was as supportive of the arts as the Canadian government is, this would be a lot better place to live. I wish we would uh, pay attention to some of that. You know, I have a sister lives half the year in Vancouver, the other half in Italy. And Bruce Allen, who's out of Vancouver, managed Martina the first 18 years of her career. So I have a lot of good Canadian friends and hangouts where I like to go, you know, in Vancouver especially. That's where Martina and I went on our honeymoon, which we were broke as fuck too. So <laughs> we flew to Seattle because it was only 300 bucks round trip. And then took this bus up to Vancouver, and it was like 20 bucks to take the bus. And this is 88. So we get dropped off at some hotel there in Vancouver, and then my sister picked us up, and we stayed at her house so we could afford to be in Vancouver and all that. And then in 2000, no, in 1997 or 8, Garth came to Vancouver. We did three shows. And the crew hotel was the same hotel where they dropped off the bus. <laughs> from the, and I saw a bus unloading people. And I went, motherfucker, 10, 11 years ago, that was me. Or 9 or 10 years ago. It's funny how life changes. And it does. And it changes fast sometimes. Um, anything you guys want to talk about? You said you still like gigging. What does a gig look like when you, when you do one? Well, I like touring is what I should say. And, you know, Martina, we're doing mostly theaters. We're doing some festivals. We're doing some fairs. We do some uh, casinos. So it's, unless you're carrying everything, it's a new world every day. Yeah. Now, we are carrying consoles. I've got an old API analog desk. Beautiful. But I cheated and put 36 API mic pre's in it because I could. <laughs> you know, I wanted a better sound. And then I carry a 33609 for the stereo bus, a pair of EMI mastering EQs. And uh, I have a DBX-165, I think, for her vocal, one of the old ones. And um, I carry a 480 and a Lexicon 200 and a PCM-42. I'm kind of all Lexicon. I do have a harmonizer also that I put a touch on, on one of our acoustic players. But I love doing shows. We don't carry PA, so every day it's a new room, right. it's a new sound, you know. And sometimes I love it, and sometimes, you know, you just figure, well, I'll try to make it sound better than anybody else has, even though I'm dealing with this. 
you know. Because he'll come back to you and say, I could sing a lot better if I could hear the monitors better. Well, <laughs> you know what's funny? Martina works off the house as much as she does yeah. the monitors. And she's not an ear person. Right. She feels too isolated. So right. we've stuck with wedges. Right. Glenn Collette is our monitor guy. One of the best in the business. So she doesn't have a problem hearing. You know? And thank God, you know, because I got to ride the bus with her, you know. I don't want to go through that all night. Oh, what the fuck? Come on. But, yeah, no. It, and, she, and she is willing, when we, you get in a place like, the Houston Astrodome or whatever, where you had 10 seconds of decay, she'll put one ear in just to make it more functional. Because she is a pro, and she'll do what it takes. You know, you know she's got the, the most incredible voice, consistent also. Does she have her mic? Uh, uh, the well, her studio mic is 251 serial number 584, and no one else uses that. And then the, the mic chain is a Telefunken V76, a Mono Fairchild, an 1176, and a Motown EQ. Wow. And it's a, you know, $100,000, $150,000 chain. It's ridiculous. But it sounds fucking incredible. incredible. And it does. You take that on the road, too? No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I used to carry Telefunken mic pre's. I had a rack of 12. It weighed about... 300 pounds, man. It was <laughs> heavy. You know, they're in these Marquette, you know, like the silver, yeah. those silver things. And uh, they sure sound good. Analog distortion is beautiful. It sounds incredible. Digital distortion sounds like ass. It's horrible. I love analog. And that's why I stick with analog on the road. I took out a PM10, a Yamaha, a new digital console they make. And it's really, really good. I always say it's the least painful digital experience I ever had. <laughs> but it still isn't analog. But it's really good. And, you know, it's this little desk, and you don't need all these racks. But you know what? I don't care. <laughs> and I'm fortunate. I'm married to the artist, so I got job security. <laughs> Thank God I'm okay at what I do. Because if I sucked, you know, that would really be a tragedy. It really would. Tom, do you have a question? Yes. When... When you started back in the in the eighties with your sound company, the I mean everything was analog, and like you said, you you still like analog, but you weren't carrying an API console on back then. I had a biamp and then a PV, yeah. Right. Yeah. The PV sixteen four or sixteen oh four. Sixteen oh four. And you know what? They had a sound. They did. Mm -hmm. I had. I a mean, board. I was using. There's a, a low end thing on a PV console on that the Mark IV or whatever yep. it was called that was really, really good. And I, I always thought PV shit, you know. And I then I heard a couple shows with that console and I went, I'm going to try one. Their double 15 two-inch horn cabinet for... Well, we didn't use a PVPA. Okay. But we used the, the, the board. Well, they were a good company back then, too. I, yeah. I, I had a one, you know, Magic Smoke came out of one of those boards a couple hours before a show. I called him up on the phone at about like 5 or 6 p.m. They grabbed some guy, the engineer was on his way out to his car, came in, pulled out the schematics, and helped me figure out the problem, and we fixed it. That's before a show. Awesome. Yeah. And nobody does anything like that. Yeah, now. it doesn't seem like it, does it? No. So really the, the question I had was the difference. The difference between, I mean, the, the industry, the live sound industry has changed so, so drastically. Well, in the 90s, you know, they remembered what they learned in the 40s, that a line array has more even dispersion and throws longer. Yeah. And everybody forgot that for 50 years. And then Christian, whatever his name is, I'm not sure, the French guy, um, built VDOSC. Mm -hmm. And it works, and it makes sense. And the biggest problem I ran into with VDOSC was companies wouldn't set it up the same. Or according to the factory spec, maybe they thought they knew more, maybe. I don't know. But the rigs weren't consistent. And now they've changed all that, so you can't fuck with the parameters too much at all, I don't think. Follow on to the array now. Oh, everybody's flown, got a line array. Flown subs or floor I subs? I hate subs, period, generally. You should be able to... I want a box that I can get enough low end out of that I don't need subs. And depending on the kind of music you're doing, obviously with pop or 
EDM or whatever, you're going to have subs for days. Yeah. But to me, great music doesn't need to be real. I don't want a lead kick drum. Right. And I hear that at so many shows. It's fucking annoying. And it is. And, you know, one time Martina and I were in L.A. and there was a Grammys thing and it was in some ballroom. And we were in the front row. And the subs were about 10, 15 feet in front of us. And every kick drum, I'm going, what the fuck? <laughs> Who's the kick drum? You know, can I even understand the words? No, because I'm fucking getting pelted by this kick drum. So I didn't know who's doing audio or anything. I went back there and I go, dudes, the fucking subs are killing us in the front. And they turned them down for like six songs. <laughs> yeah, until some other guest artist came up and his guy went, fuck it, and turned them back up. And then we just left. But I mean, you know, luckily I, th I must have known somebody on the crew because they wouldn't just probably do that unless they thought it was somebody who maybe actually knew what they were talking knew, about. you know. Yeah. And I hate, that's one of the reasons I don't like subs. I don't like to rely on them for my low end. But the technology with subs and the way you can steer low end these days is huge. And this goes back to shit we've known for 60 years or whatever, or 70 years. Physics doesn't change, really. No, it doesn't. Yeah. At least not around here. You know, maybe where the antimatter is. Okay, it's all different. Whatever. I don't know. I don't know. But, In the TARDIS. Yeah. You know. Any other questions? Yeah. Hey, but I asked Mark this. Smoking in the studio. I he love it. You have a great Shoot sport. fucking heroin. I don't care. <laughs> Just don't die. <laughs> Man, I'm proud my gears had smoke around it. You know, I think it helps sometimes. I don't know. <laughs> I shouldn't say that because I quit smoking cigarettes three years ago, and I vape now. This is the speedball blend right now. It's pretty good. I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> this nicotine. And um, yes, smoking is not good for the people in the room or the gear, I'm sure. But I never, ever think about that or let it bother me. You know? Unless you're sitting there blowing on the piece of gear, your smoke, all the time, you're probably not going to see a lot of problem i don't know but then again studios used to look like an aa meeting you know it was <laughs> heavy smoke in the whole room but you know i mean it used to be yeah. we have a lot of air cleaners now and if guys smoke bob seeger he smokes deal with it if you want seeger at your studio let him smoke martina did a duet with him and we were in la shooting a video for it and bob smoking i go bob i fucking love you man i'm smoking away you know in la you can't smoke i don't know in the city limits or there's some rules yeah. i don't know what they are but i loved it because bob smoked and nobody said a word i fear fuck it if he can i am yeah. i've had the same experience that slash come in yeah and he's like do you have an ashtray didn't say can i smoke just said do you have an ashtray yeah. One of my questions to potential graduates when I'd interview them, I go, okay, let's say you go get a gig at a studio for the first time. You're getting hired as an engineer or whatever, and or an assistant even. And um, they have a no smoking policy. And I go, the producer comes in and he's smoking a cigarette. What's the first thing you do? Well, find him a fucking ashtray. That's what you do. You tell him to smoke away, man. You know, if the studio has a problem with it, let them deal with it. You're not going to fuck up your relationship with this guy unless you're just that fucking pansy about smoke or whatever, or <laughs> that wimpy about it. Whatever. I shouldn't say wimpy because, yeah, I know. We all want to stay healthy. Of course we do. If we want to stay healthy, we wouldn't be doing this shit. I'll tell you right now. <laughs> We'd be doing something where you had some physical exercise, you know. <laughs> yeah. No. Anyway. Any other questions? Desert Island Mike, for you. Oh, man. Either that 251 or 47, number 193. We have 36 U47s. 193 is the king. Which is what we used yesterday on vocals. Yeah. Hey. Oh. Wow. That's my favorite 47. Massenburg said it was the greatest example of a 47 he'd ever heard in his life. Wow. You know, and George has a lot longer track record than I do. The great thing about having a studio is I can steal from the best. You learn quickly. You go in a session, and let's say it's Peter Asher's doing something. 
and this snare sound is killing you. Now, number one, write down who the drummer is because that's 80% of it. But I want to know the mic chain and what compression and what EQ, what they do. I want to know. And you can find out. You know, when you own it, that helps. <laughs> or pay them for it, whatever. We'll never really own it. I think my loan goes till I'm 73 or something. I don't know. I don't care. I told Martina, if I had 80, I'm getting another loan. I'm starting another business. <laughs> <laughs> I am. I'm going to fuck somebody before I die. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you know they'll force me to get life insurance. And nah, anyway, whatever. <laughs> but no, you know, it's, it, it's great. And there's a million ways to approach everything you do. What's the right way? Well, shit. The one that works. Yeah, whatever makes people tap their foot the most, you know, or whatever. It's so true. But, you know, I usually, when I go to record, I try to go for a very pure, incredible representation of what I'm hearing. I don't fuck with it when I'm tracking. I figure if the mix guy wants to distort everything, he can do that. But I'd rather have a pure piano or acoustic or vocal or whatever. Now, you can manipulate it however you like, but I want to give you the best I can possibly give you. Because if you send them something that's already fucked with and they want it pure, well, you're in a quandary. You know, that can't happen. Back when they made records, they were really mixing and making a record from the first tracking session. And making decisions, timely decisions. As Ken Scott told me, we used to capture a great performance. Now we try to create one. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to fly verse two to verse one. And we'll mm -hmm. fly the third chorus to the first chorus because it's better. And we're going to patch together and make this fucking thing work somehow and create a great record. That's what they try to do. And uh, it's better to capture a great performance. As Massenberg would tell me, there used to be blood on the floor on a tracking day. Well, it's because they needed it right. They couldn't. They didn't have Pro Tools. I mean, two-inch tape. You know, it, you can still manipulate that. Side. Did I turn it off or break it? Eh, I'm gonna break it all the time. All right. Anyway, um, you know, when the Beatles would record four tracks on a four-track and bounce it down to one track of a second machine, they were putting into concrete those relationships between whatever those whatever they did, either the drum kit or drums and bass or whatever it was. So they were committing at a very early stage that which we don't seem capable of doing now, you know, in a way. Not enough anyway. We were talking about even maybe 15 years ago before there was any sort of real mixing in the box. You'd go into a studio and there'd be two, two digital delays, one reverb, an H3000 and a chamber. So you were forced into going, oh, you know, uh, you, you had to print. Right. If you wanted a delay on a guitar, you printed the delay because there was only one freaking delay in the yeah. room. Yeah. So it, that our limitations forced us to be more creative. Yes. That's what, and Jeff Emmerich told me, I didn't have much gear. We just had to abuse the gear we had to get the sounds we got. But, you know, when Lennon wanted to fly around the room recording a vocal, Jeff goes, why don't we put it through a Leslie? That's fucking smart shit. <laughs> right there. That's smart as hell. safer. Yeah. When, when, uh, man, it's really, you know, the guys who got us going, um, you know, putting a pencil in front of a singer instead of, because they didn't have windscreens yet. Mm -hmm. Obviously, simple things that you have to think about and be creative in your approach. Jeff always told me, you know, Try different shit. He goes, take a 57 and put it in a bucket and set it next to the kit. And I did. It sounded terrible. <laughs> okay? It sucked. But we tried it. What if it would have been fucking great? You know, all of a sudden there's, it's like Phil Collins in the air tonight. We got this new drum sound. Eddie Kramer press, likes to put a, put a paint can inside the kit. Yeah. yeah. You know, that? why not? Some extra reflections in there. Little, sure. Yeah. In that man, in that small a space, yeah. it probably gets fatter, you know. But, um, you know, I love recording. Tracking days, like I said, are my favorite. 
and I love gigging live. It's fun because you don't get a second chance it's right now, and that creates a certain skill level where you have to be good at what you do. You're on a festival and you get the console 15 minutes before the gig, you know, before you start. You know, whatever it takes, you're going to make it happen or die trying, you know. And luckily, I've been doing live sound so long, 40 years or whatever, I'm good at what I do. And I know it. I have more confidence live than I do in the studio because I haven't been in the studio that long. 15, 16 years. Even though on a tracking day, I feel like I can compete with anybody, anytime. I'm fortunate that we have great microphones and great mic pre's. You know, an RCA BA11A on an acoustic guitar, I haven't found a better mic pre than that. And it's an old 1940s tube fucking mic pre. But it's good. Now we've got to recut all the acoustics. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, that did happen with Cheryl Crow. Steve Jordan came in, and Steve and I are pretty close. And he goes, yeah, dude, I, I just need to do a str uh, string overdub. I go, cool. And then <clears throat> it's about noon, and he goes, hey, John, she wants to do another vocal. I go, Steve, don't do it. I'm just telling you, don't do it. Because the record's about done. I go, if you do a vocal here, she's going to fucking have to rent that shit and go re-sing all her vocals. He goes, ha, ah, right. Well, guess what happened? <laughs> I gave her Martina's rack. Oh. I'm not and uh, and the U47 you guys used yesterday. And she goes, "Well, this is the best my vocals ever sounded." So she ran at the rack for two weeks and redid all her vocals. That's torture. But I knew it would happen because I'm married to a girl like Cheryl Crow. You know, they they care about if something all of a sudden is better. Well, we're redoing everything. You know, and that's. Frustrating, but you know what? Bring it on. You, you're the artist. You got to put your art out there in a way that makes you happy. You know that you're proud of. That's why we got into all the volume wars with compression. Everybody wanted their song louder on the radio. Hmm. Really, it's what because louder we perceive as better. If you listen to two mics and one's three dB louder than the other one, you're going to pick the louder one. Pretty much. I mean, if there's, there could be a guitar solo that's out of tune, but if it's loud enough, it wins. <laughs> it just does. Volume wins. So when you really judge anything, do it at the same fucking level. That way you know apples and apples. Because that's important. Every, any kid with an L2 thinks they're a mastering guy now, you know? And it's <laughs> the whole song, and then, you know, that's just what happens. I like dynamics. Listen to a day in the life. You know, it goes from this huge orchestral thing to an acoustic piano. Oh, that's fucking great. I like dynamics. It's emotional. The higher quality at which you listen to music, the more emotional it becomes. I listened to a song on my computer just through the little speakers, and I went, ah. And then I heard it in the control room, and I went, oh, God, man. And, you know, it just hit me ten times harder because I had the full sound. But. One last question. Ralph. So we are gaining up now our way to the musical business and to a little bit of a success, what everyone can do, and we do the best. So what is for you the most important, except ear, what we have to keep in mind? That attitude is 99% of the gig. Having a great attitude is more important to your future than anything else. And I don't mean just in the studio or in, on the road or whatever. I mean with your parents or your brothers and sisters, your significant other, your friends. Having a great attitude, will, you will win. And you have a shit attitude, good luck. People don't want to be around assholes. They really don't. I mean, I use Massenburg as an example. He could be hard, tough to work with. He's got, he invented parametric EQ. He's got seven or eight Grammys. He recorded some of the greatest shit you ever heard. September. I think he engineered that. He mixed Tears for Fears. Woman in the oh, yeah. No, that was uh, Clear Mountain, sorry. Well, yeah. anyway, but George couldn't get arrested around here because he's a pain in the ass. 
It's his way or no way. <clears throat> and people don't like that. They don't want to deal with that. So to me, a great attitude is the most important thing. Number two, talent. Keep learning, obviously. You know, the more you know about... You know, when I first started out and I was doing live sound, I'd get one reverb. I had a Delta Lab acoustic computer. Well, I learned it inside and out. I had a one delay. I learned it inside and out. And, you know, since then, I don't know this Shadow Hill compressor the way I should. I, you know, because I haven't really got down in the trenches with it. But I love a stay level, especially on bass. I love Fairchild's on about anything. But what's interesting is we have all the things you talked about, and that's the only thing that didn't get used. Yeah. Because you look at it and go, it looks like time it could take learn. some work to get yeah. it dialed properly, you know? Yeah. And. Of course, you know, you can't just sit around all fucking day, you know, fucking with gear either. You got to make a living somehow, you know. But I, you know, I try to read and keep up and there's certain people I trust when it comes to to gear that hear similarly to me. And, you know, and when I see something used, if I, let's say I have a bass guitar and I'm not really digging it and I think, well, I'll put an LA-2A on it. Well, unless it makes me go, wow... Why, what's the point? If it doesn't make me go wow, take it off. You know, let's try and then stay level. And then it made me go wow. So that's what I use mostly now. When I record bass, I use a Motown tube pre. It's recently come out. Before that, we had the Wolf Box. Al Sutton, who's an engineer up in Detroit, and he's a gear manufacturer too. And he got together with Mike, the original engineer from Motown. And they designed some new shit, and it's great. And it is. So I'm going to cheat in every possible way I can to make my session better than anybody else's. I want the best shit. I want the best players. Man, they make me look good. The players in this town, if you can't record that shit, my 12-year-old could record a band of great players, and it's going to be pretty great somehow. But a good attitude is number one. You know, I try to be kind. I try to pe treat people like I'd like to be treated, you know. I'm not good at the good old boy network or I'm not good at fucking being manipulative and all that. Can't do it. Life's too short. I just won't. So, you know, it's funny. I, I, I don't advance as fast as I could if I wanted to play a lot more games. But you know what? I'm pretty happy. You'll be able to sleep at night. Yeah, I can. I can. <laughs> but no, rule number one, great attitude. Rule number two, marry a rock star. Because then you get out of the studio. <laughs> It'll help pay for it. It fucking makes it easier, you know. It takes away some pressure. Um, I'm gear queer. I love gear. They're all just tools. They're all colors on the palette. That's what we need. Is there a piece of gear that you don't have that you want? You know, I don't have an original Mellotron. Mm. Nice. I've got the, you know, the modern, you know, one that doesn't have tape. But that's the only, and Blackbird's unusual in the respect that we have a lot of band gear, way more band gear than most studios. We have 60 drum kits and 160 snares, and we have 60 plus guitar amps, and we've got bass rigs, and we have 100 guitars laying around, and, and good ones. Um, but on the, you know, I had an EMI, uh, curb bender, but John Bryan really wanted it and it's a stereo passive EQ and he gave me $38,000 for it. And that was five, six years ago because no one's using it. And I thought, well, why have it if we don't use it? And Wade Chandler Chandler put out a newer version of the curb bender, which I'm convinced is pretty close to identical to the old one. So, you know, not really. I'm not missing anything major that I can think of. I think you're going to be in cold away. Yeah, I know. Yeah.
But you've been I commit to thank many you things. ever so much. No, no, no. Warren, thank you. Thank man. you. It's, it's been a pleasure. Amazing. Thanks for having us here. Absolutely. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you. Don't do that. Thank you. With life well lived. Well, you know what? And you're still going. Just How are you? Do the best Hello. you can and hope for the Love best. Man. I, I want to get a kick out of here. Thank you for having the passion of building this place and allowing us to be here. I, you know what? That that is important to me. You get paid with the smiles. Don't you Absolutely. Much? You you well, you know smiles. what? When people come here, they can go anywhere else, and they come here. It makes me glad we did what we did. But we're going to give them hopefully a better experience in the studio than they would have had anywhere else. Your satisfaction comes out and make it smile. Oh, man, you know. Can I get a quick Thanks. picture? Sure. <laughs> Come on, Tony. <laughs> I'm going to Photoshop my face in here, though. You know that. <laughs> Sam, there you Sam, go. You All right, right John, thank, thank you. Man. Pleasure. So we have for like three hours. Oh, 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 oh,